and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. And uh, this week we are putting some miles underneath us. Uh, we're in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and you guys that uh, are hip and cool and know what's going on in the gun world, you'll know that in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, there is an A number one gun maker, and the number one gun maker in Baton Rouge is Red Jacket Firearms. I want to take a moment to thank all of our good friends at Red Jacket for opening up their facility to us and inviting us in, giving us a behind the scenes tour of the, not only the pro shop, but the manufacturing facility. They let us into their war room. They let us look at all their cool toys, their machine guns and all that good stuff. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about our good friends at Red Jacket. But before we get into that, we want to uh, thank our good friends uh, at Keltec Firearms of Cocoa, Florida, and uh, remind you that uh, if you want either an A, really inexpensive gun that you can carry in your pocket, you can look at Keltec. Or if you want a really cool, unique gun like the RFB or the KSG, you can get on a very extensive waiting list, but you can get on the waiting list. <laughs> and this is week four. This is week number four of our crossbreed super tuck contest. That's right. For the last four weeks, the last three weeks up to this point, we have been picking one winner a week for a free super tuck deluxe holster from crossbreed. And all you have to do to be eligible for this contest, it's really ridiculously easy, is you just go to studentofthegun.com. And over on the right-hand side, there's a little sign-up sheet for our weekly newsletter. We don't spam you. We don't sell your addresses. But what we do is we tell you every week, we send you a, a, a newsletter and say, hey, on Student of the Gun this week, this is what we're doing on the TV show. This is what we're doing on the radio. This is what this is the latest article. And if we have anything you know special to offer you, you know books, DVDs, stickers, whatever, we'll let you know. Uh, it's it's super easy. And if you are an active subscriber, uh, we draw all of our winners' names from the active subscriber list. So go on over there to studentofthegun.com, sign up. It's quick, it's easy, and it's painless. Now. We, uh, we're doing obviously several things over here at the uh, Red Jacket. Now in Baton Rouge, we went ahead and, uh, we filmed some material for the show. Uh, and we're recording the radio show right now as you're listening to this. And, uh, we also, uh, we took some pictures and we did, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit of a fan meet and greet. Uh, we did a little book signing, a little DVD, uh, sale and so forth. And anybody who, uh, is listening that came out to the red jacket, uh, if you're listening now, if you came out today, uh, we really appreciate you stopping by and saying hello to us. Now, uh, <laughs> Jerry, do you want to talk about the, uh, this, what you did, I was, now while I was in the pro shop, Red Jacket has a store. They have a pro shop store where you can buy their t-shirts and, and all their various, you know, hats and, and goodies and, and little unique things. Uh, and the store is open Monday through Saturday, right, Jared? Yeah. So it, the only day it's closed is Sunday, but it's open, uh, normal hours, uh, Monday through Saturday. So I'm over there in the pro shop doing my little thing. Well, Jared, he takes the camera. And he goes next door to the manufacturing facility, and he got to get a behind-the-scenes look at Red Jacket Manufacturing. Hey, Jared, what did you see today? Well, while you were over here in the pro shop doing the, the hard work, I got to go take my first tour of the manufacturing facility. And actually, our uh, our friend Red Jacket Rebecca and Zach Hall, they took me over there and kind of gave me a tour. And there's some pretty cool stuff over there. Will's got his... You know, his muzzle loading stuff that he likes to do hanging up. And when you first walk in the door and it's a muzzle loading wall, he's got his primitive outfits and his muzzle loading, his muzzle loaders and everything like that. And then, uh, you go past that and there's an office that's got all these cool guns up on the wall. And, uh, he, they've got all their super top secret TV stuff in there that, but I couldn't show you that. So. <laughs> But I got the kind of the runaround on that, and then um, past that, they've got the actual machinery. And Zach Hall is the designer of suppressors for Red Jacket now, and that man is intelligent. I was kind of picking his brain for a little bit, and I was just blown away at all the different components that go into the, the suppressors. It's it's real simple from the outside, but when you start picking his brain, there's so much thought that goes into each suppressor. But the coolest part, the part that I liked the most was the war room. And it's, it's crazy. 
there's just a lot of what did you man. see? The, <laughs> what did you see in the war room, Jared? I saw any everything that I wanted to see. <laughs> there's a bunch of machine guns. Uh, there's just uh, it's hard to explain. You just have to watch the show when it comes out, and you'll see. Uh, well, you know, we featured on Student of the Gun, who are our buddies at Kiapa Firearms and our buddies at Chris. They both sponsor Student of the Gun TV. Uh, what did you see from them in the war room? Oh, uh, that actually wasn't in the war room. They had these hanging up on the wall. Oh, okay. What because they're so special. If you've seen the movie Total Recall, you know that the Kiapa Rhino was featured in it, as well as the Chris Vector. And both of those props that were used in the movie were hanging on the wall in there. Very cool. Very cool. Now, uh, did you get to do some live fire? I did. I got to shoot a seven inch barreled AR fully auto and it was felt like I was being punched in the face, but I've done that before. So, you know, what else did you shoot? Uh, I shot a 22. It wasn't a conversion 22. It was an AR 22. Just that's how it was made. And any, any, did you shoot the AR suppressed? Yeah, I shot the, the, yeah, I shot it without the suppressor and then I put the suppressor on to see, you know, what the difference was. And it makes quite a bit of difference. A little, little bit more pleasant with the oh, suppressor yeah. on it, huh? Yeah, way more pleasant. Well, congratulations to our little friend over there across the board for me, Jared Markle, for getting into not only the Red Jacket War Room, but a lot of you guys who have watched the show, watched their show on Discovery Channel, know that when they test the guns, there's a, a test tunnel. And that test tunnel is actually, it's uh, just adjacent to the shop. It's indoors. It's, what, about 20 meters deep, Jared? Yeah, about 20 meters deep. And that's uh, when, when they're testing stuff, they have to go in there uh, to tee and it. Because, you know, the shop, actually, you know, when you watch the show and they show you all the Louisiana swamp scenes and the gators and the snakes and stuff, I mean, you'd think they're like in the middle of a swamp or something. Or <laughs> you think that they're like, man, all these gators and snakes, they must be. No, they're actually, they're in the industrial part of Baton Rouge. So you, you can't just go outside and just start ripping off full auto AKs. The neighbors get kind of excited about stuff like that. <laughs> uh, another cool thing I, I forgot to mention when I walked into the, the office first, there was a, a gun sitting on a rack that was really dirty and had dirt all over it. And it just looked like they had beat the crap out of it. And uh, Zach picked it up and he said, yeah, somebody finally oiled this and th we didn't like it. Because what they were doing is they took an AR and they, they fired like, uh, I think, 3,500 rounds through it. Was it, one so of their, it was one of the Red Jacket yeah. Firearms ARs that yeah, they manufacture. It was, it was one of theirs. So they were doing testing on it. And they didn't want to clean it because they wanted to see how far they could run it before it malfunctioned. Well, they got 3,500 rounds, I believe. And then somebody, I'm not going to mention any names, but somebody over there went and put oil on it. And so now they have to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, well, so they were able to get 3,500 rounds into the torture test before somebody decided to got their OCD up and they decided to clean it, huh? Yep. Okay. Well, yeah, we, uh, we've, if you guys have been following Student of the Gun for the last year or so, you know that, uh, you know, being on the Gulf Coast like we are, the Mississippi Gulf Coast, we're actually only about two hours away from Baton Rouge. And uh, we've gotten over and we've spent some time with them. We went to the birthday bash, fired off cannons and machine guns and what have you. And let me tell you this. I'm going to give you, because you are a Student of the Gun radio listener, I'm going to give you an exclusive or I'm going to give you a behind the scenes hint. And most of you may have, you know, some of you probably have figured this out already. But if you watch the television show that's on Discovery Channel, keep in mind that television is television. Reality shows are not really reality shows. Why is that? Well, because if you're A&E or your Discovery or your History Channel or your whatever, you have professional production crews. And the professional production crews and television crews, they know that if they just film you doing your job, that people are going to be bored and they're not going to watch it. I mean, think about it. If a film crew has walked into your work and stood over your shoulder for eight hours where you, while you were working, would everyone in America want to watch that? Probably not. So the some of the stuff that you see on the show, some of the, the drama, some of the... Let, let's face it. Let's face it. They have, Discovery Channel wants TV ratings. That's it. The people that I have met over there in Baton Rouge are some of the best people the most down-to-earth, gracious, just real folks 
that you would ever want to meet. I'll give you a great example. Uh, if you've watched their, if you've watched their show and you know anything about Red Jacket Farms, you'll know Joe. Uh, Joe's got the very uniquely trimmed goatee, you know, and mustache. And Joe had to come in yesterday or today. I'm sorry. He had to come in today, uh, to his office and to get to his office, he had to go through the pro shop. Now, he, he's a busy guy. He's got a lot on his plate at Red Jacket Firearms. I mean, between the, the stocks and the firearms and the accessories and all that, you know, he's got a lot to do. But he came in and he had to walk to, he was walking through the, I was doing the book signing thing, you know, and he came into the pro shop. There's probably 15, 20 people in the pro shop at the time. And people saw him and they recognized him, obviously, from the TV show. And, uh, and they asked him, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, can, can we take your picture? And they, you know, pull their phones out. And even though I know that he was busy, I know he had a lot of work that he needed to do. He took the time to shake their hands, to thank them for coming to, you know, for coming to the shop, uh, asked them where they were from, you know, pose for pictures, just super gracious. And if you've, a lot of you guys might not, you know, understand what that is, you know, it's all about, but the, the truth of the matter is when you see when you see that you know kind of as a fly on the wall when you stand back that really is a testament to someone's character that's a testament to their personality and even though he was coming and going and he had a lot of stuff to do every time someone asked him if they could have a picture with him he stopped what he was doing he you know he greeted him he thanked him for being there and he posed for pictures and ladies and gentlemen let me tell you what if you've ever, most of you probably have not been around Hollywood people or television people or movie people, but there's only a small percentage of people that are in the Hollywood TV world that would do that, really. Uh, but in our world, in, in the firearms industry world, uh, Jared, you've seen it at SHOT Show. We were just talking about that. Tell me about some of your experiences from SHOT, from you know celebrities at the SHOT Show floor. Yeah, every year we go to SHOT Show and... There's always some kind of celebrity there. You got, you know, we know we had Matt Hughes, uh, Ted Nugent's always there. There's just a lot of down to earth. The wrestler guy, who's the wrestler guy? Who's the name Sha- of Sean Sha- Michaels. Sean Michaels. Sean Michaels is there. Yeah, he. There's there's a lot of celebrities there, and every one of them that I've noticed walking around the floor, they'll stop and say, you know, they'll take pictures with their fans because they can't make it 20 feet down the aisle without 30,000 people stopping them. You know. Yeah, and you you, you got to feel bad for them because they'll be uh, on the floor and they need a potty break. Yeah, and they need to get to the men's room. But to get to the men's room, they have to pass three hundred people. And who is it that said? He goes, dude, I'll pose for any. I'll, I'll do autographs or pictures anytime you want, but just leave me alone while I'm in the bathroom. Yeah, who was that? I can't remember. Uh, now. Was, I'm not sure. Who it was one. Was. <laughs> That's when you see them with their head down, looking at their feet, walking. Leave them alone. Yeah, leave them alone. They're trying to get to the bathroom. They've been holding it for 30 minutes and they need to get over there. Uh, <laughs> oh, but yeah, we, we, it's just, uh, yeah, no, as you know, uh, if you've been paying attention, if you've been listening to Student of the Gun Radio, you know that uh, we are uh, right now producing material. We're, we're taping material constantly because we've expanded the outreach. Not only are we on studentofthegun.com, uh, you know, iTunes or whatever you happen to be listening to the radio show on, but we're going, we've partnered with the Hunt Channel and uh, Hunt Channel TV is, is, uh, they're on Angel 2 Network on Dish. And if you just look up channel 266, you go to your, if you've got a, if you're a Dish subscriber, go to channel 266, uh, and look up the channel guide and it'll give you all the, you know, dates and times of the new shows. And we are on Sunday night, 7 p.m. So set your DVRs. That's and, Eastern. And for all of you that have had the question, can we still watch your show online? Yes. We're still going to put them up online after they air on the Hunt Channel. Uh, so don't worry about that. We've had tons of people write in to us asking if we're still going to be available on. Yep, yep. We're not going to, we're not going to reduce our online presence. This, you know, our partnership with Hunt Channel. On Channel TV, it's not going to reduce our outreach. It's going to increase our outreach. So if you want to DVR it, sit in your easy chair on a Sunday night or Monday morning or whenever and watch the show, knock yourself out. 
Now let's, uh, Jared. Let's go ahead and jump into the student of the week. We always, uh, we always have some really. You guys have been doing a great job. Let me tell you. Uh, if you know, pat yourself on the back unless you're driving. If you're driving, keep your hands on the wheel. But otherwise, go ahead and pat yourself on the back because we get a lot of fantastic material via our student of the gun Facebook page, and we also get a lot of good, uh, a good, a lot of good letters and inquiries and so forth. Ah, before we get too far in, Jared, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give everybody here a lanyard. And this doesn't just apply to student of the gun. Any, it applies to if you, whatever your favorite show is or your favorite radio program or what have you. Let me give you guys a hint. If you want to submit a question, submit a question. <laughs> Jared's looking at me. He's got the smile on his face because he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, a question is one sentence with a question mark at the end of it. Followed up possibly by a a clarification or or a follow up, uh, two t- two sentences max. If you type three or four paragraphs, now I'm not telling you not to do that, but what I'm telling you is this: as somebody that used to do hiring many moons ago as a manager, if I got a resume that was four and a half pages long, it went to the bottom of the stack because I didn't have time to read four and a half pages. Uh, a good resume is one clear page and then maybe another page of references attached. Same thing goes with when you write into, and I'm not, like I said, this isn't just student of the gun radio talking. This is anybody. If you like, you know, gun talk radio or you name your favorite program, you want to write in. If you want to get the host's attention, if you want them, if you send them three, let's just, it's humans are humans. And uh, we do everything we can between Jared and I to go through the mailboxes and to read every single person's email. And we get how much, Jared? A lot. We get a lot. Uh, uh, More than we can read. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, for uh, number one, forgive us if we don't get to you right away. It's not that we're ignoring you, it's just that we've got a lot of stuff. But if you've got a legitimate question, like, you know, guys, I want to know about this or let's talk about this. Put it in a one to two sentence format with a question mark at the end of it. A question isn't four paragraphs telling me about your favorite concealed carry gun. OK, but uh, when it comes to the student of the week, now, remember, if you're a student of the week, uh, if we pick your question to be used on air like we're about to do right now, uh, we will send you an official student of the gun T-shirt. Or if you like, a lot of guys have said, hey, I've already got one of your shirts. Can I have the book instead? And uh, we're pretty flexible with stuff like that. So, Jared, take it away and tell us who our student of the week is. Our student of the week is Jody Lang, and Jody reads water meters. She wants to know about dogs. How would you handle the situation if you know a dog came up, started barking or attacking you? Okay, and just for a point of car- clarification, my uh, my good son Jody could be a man's or a woman's name. So you, uh, we're not we're not sure the uh, the sex of this this uh, question, but Jody can be a man or a woman's name. Uh, well, that is a fantastic question. And essentially, you know, my answer when someone says, how do I deal with a vicious dog? Two words, pepper spray, two letters, OC. But so let's talk about what, and people say, well, OC, mace, we, we fall back into that trap that, uh, the, the Kleenex Band-Aid Jello trap where we use things, we use terms to describe everything. You know, every adhesive bandage in the world people call Band-Aids, even though we know Band-Aid is a specific brand. Well, Mace, uh, Mace is a registered trademark brand, and it is a liquid CN gas, okay? Uh, people say Mace, and they, they use that as a descriptor for all aerosolized self-defense products. And that's, and it's not really the case. You know, like, oh, Mace, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. No, <laughs> it is not even close to the same thing. Uh, if you ask a police officer, a mo- you know, Today, in 2013, if you talk to a police officer uh, about uh, OC or pepper spray or mace, if they've been in, the, if they're a new cop, if they've been on the job less than five, six, seven years, they probably never seen a mace product or a CN or a CS handheld product because it's been at least 20 years since they went out of favor. Well, the reason they went out of favor is they were they worked very very poorly. Uh what you talk to old cops when I first became a police officer, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh I would talk to the old guys and that it, and pepper spray was a hard sell. 
to the old guys because in the 70s and early 80s and so forth, they you know, even to the late 80s, they were issued mace and told, oh, just squirt it in their face and blah, blah, blah. And what they found, all the old guys would tell you, that's all that stuff is a bunch of crap and it doesn't work. And here's what happens. He goes, you spray them and then you still end up fighting them. And you, and so by the time you're done rolling around on the ground with the bad guy and you get the cuffs on them, you're covered with the stuff. They're covered with the stuff. Everybody's eyes are running and uh, they had no faith and confidence at all in mace or liquid CS or liquid CN. And pepper spray came along and they're like, Hey, this, you guys should try this. And all these old hardcore crusty dudes are like, ah, it's all the same. It's a bunch of junk. It's garbage. I ain't going to use that. <laughs> and I became a, uh, a police, a law enforcement OC instructor. OC stands for oleoresin capsicum. It's the police term for pepper spray. And I became an instructor in 1995 and I went through a, a, a two-day instructor's training course and, and learned all about the ins and outs. I mean, the neat thing about the course is the first two to three hours were actually about the history of the product, how it's made, how it works, why it works, and so forth. And I can tell you that I've sprayed uh, over over 300 people. It's been over 300 human beings that I've sprayed uh, with pepper spray. And I've sprayed innumerable animals of all sorts and shapes and sizes. No, I don't go to the zoo and just start spraying the monkeys with it. I've sprayed, you know, pest animals, nuisance animals, threatening animals. And as far as spraying animals is concerned, the people, you know, the thing is, you know, what about pit bulls? What about Rottweilers? What about this? And what about that? And an attack dog, a trained attack dog, if they get their jaws clamped down on your arm or your leg, it doesn't matter how much how much stuff you spray in their faces, they're probably not going to let go because that's just what they do. Uh, if you have a dog that is menacing you, that's growling, that won't get out of your, you know, you're trying to get away or, or go through an area and they won't get out of your way. They're, uh, uh, if you juice them, then before they start chomping on you and chewing your legs and arms, yes, that is the time that it will work. And let me tell you why. Okay, oleoresin capsicum is the, uh, it's, I guess, the professional term for pepper spray. And the reason they call it pepper spray is because capsicum is found in chili peppers. You know, jalapenos, habaneros, all that good stuff. And it's actually been used as a gastric stimulant and as uh, for medicinal purposes for centuries. If you go back, you'll find that uh, they were extracting capsicum or pepper paste or pepper powder from chili peppers, you know, two, three hundred years ago and using it medicinally. Well, what they found is they take and when they produce a uh, pepper spray product, they take actual peppers, actual habaneros or jalapenos or bird peppers or, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. And, and they extract the capsaicin or the capsicum. That's the hot stuff. They extract that from the pepper and they put it into an aerosolized can with a propellant with some type of, uh, you know, an agent. And, and generally the agent, it, they have water based and alcohol based. And I'm not really going to get into that, but it's, it, it's just some type of an agent uh, that they can put under pressure and you spray. You spray into the face of animals or humans, what have you. And what oleoresin capsicum does is it's a, uh, a micro, they're little micro particles. You can't really see them. When it comes out, you see what you're seeing is the carrier. That's what you're seeing essentially is the carrier. Now, the, uh, the oleoresin capsicum makes the, it, it colorizes it so it's kind of an amber, uh, an amberish color, like a, almost a rusty amber color. When it hits your face, it does two things. It affects, it's an inflammatory. And so when the OC particles get into your mucous membrane, and where is their mucous membrane? Around your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and so forth. It inflames the mucous membrane. If it gets just on your skin and you start sweating, it gets in the pores, it gets hot and it burns. Now, think about that in and around your eyes. Think about it up inside of your nose. Think about it in your mouth not going to feel real good. Essentially, it addresses the two primal fears that human beings or really any creature that is alive has. And those are blindness and suffocation. Uh, 
Now, no, it does not cause you to choke to death. But what it does gets in your mouth. If you breathe it in through your nose, it goes into your trachea and it inflames it. It bothers it. It, it, and you start, you'll cough. You cough real hard. <clears throat> and people think, oh, I'm losing the ability to breathe. That is a scary thing. Uh, also, it gets into the eyeballs. If it gets into the eyeballs, the eyes think, I'm on fire. You know, subconsciously, your eyes are like, I'm on fire. We are on fire. We're slamming the eyelid shut to protect the eyeballs. It's a natural response. And what will happen with animals, as I've seen, I've sprayed uh, vicious dogs, you know, menacing dogs, uh, rabid raccoons, snakes. Yes, believe it or not, I had to use it on a snake. Uh, you know, a, a couple, I've, I've done it on raccoons a couple of times, feral cats and so forth. And it messes up their, their OODA loop. If, if a dog could have an OODA loop, it messes it up. It goes from, I'm going to growl at you and I'm going to bark at you and I might bite you to a, holy crap, what is this stuff in my eyes and in my nose? Now you'll have people say, oh, dog noses aren't the same as human noses. And so it doesn't affect them. Well, and they don't have tear ducts like humans have tear ducts and blah, blah. Well, that's, that's the old CS guys talking to you, telling you that, uh, that mace doesn't work on dogs. Well, because it didn't work on dogs. It was a different type of chemical. Mace is, uh, mace is a, like I said, it's a trademark product, but it essentially is a liquid CN or a tear. It's a lacrimator. Put that one in your pocket. There's a lanyard for you. A lacrimator. Now, what is it to lacrimate? If someone is lacrimating, what are they doing? They're crying. They're tearing. So a lacrimator is something that makes you, that uh, affects your tear ducts and makes you cry. That's all that mace is. It's a lacrimator. It makes you cry. And so it doesn't really work on dogs. If you want something that will work on a vicious animal, whether, like I said, whether it's a dog, a raccoon, a snake, what have you, use pepper spray, use OC, oleo resin capsicum. So, Jody, uh, that was a good question. It was a great question for you. Uh, it, OC is a good product. Now, real, you know, asterisk here quick. If you're going to use a pepper spray product, buy it from a law enforcement supply store or from Amazon, but uh, don't buy the the cheap garbage that you find on the spindly rack at the gas station. That stuff's been sitting there for six months and it has a six month shelf life. So enough said. Now that, uh, that discussion on, you know, how to deal with vicious animals, and the answer is pepper spray, that discussion leads us directly into the next topic. And this topic is one that we really, we've legitimately and purposely avoided just because so much has been going on. So many other people have been talking about it. We didn't really want to be a an also ran or so forth, but we can no longer ignore it. And we're, of course, we're talking about the Trayvon Martin felonious assault trial. And you're, I know, I just got you, didn't I? You're like, what? How could how could he be on trial? He's dead. Well, essentially, what you have going on, or what you've had going on for the last you know several weeks is the determination as to whether or not Trayvon Martin committed felonious assault against one George Zimmerman. They're like, oh, it's against Zimmerman. Well, yeah, whatever. But the fact is, is whether when they find, uh, when they find uh, Zimmerman to be not guilty, what you're, the de facto is, is if Zimmerman is not guilty, what that means is, Posthumously, Trayvon Martin is guilty of felonious assault. Now, there's a lot of stuff about this case. People want to talk about the prosecution, want to talk about the defense, want to talk about the witnesses, want to talk about this, want to talk about what George Zimmerman had for breakfast that morning before he went out that night, all that stuff. Let me tell you what, most of it is all smoke and mirrors. Now, what do we know? What do you, as an intelligent student of the gun, know about uh the media. What do you know about distraction? What did I tell you? How do you disarm an armed populace? Through ignorance, distraction, and guilt or shame. And while you're, uh, while all of the major news networks have been totally consumed with Martin Zimmerman news, what else has been going on in the world that they have not been reporting on? Ask yourself that. What are you being distracted from? 
Because let's let's be serious here. This happened in Florida, what, a year ago? I don't even know. I guess a year or so ago. It happened in Florida. And you are in California or you're in Texas or you're in Maine, Chicago, Pennsylvania, wherever you happen to be sitting, standing, running, driving right now. Why do you know about it? Uh, it, Across the United States, across the world, do people get shot during crimes, during the commission of crimes all the time? Yeah, pretty much. It happens every day. People defend themselves with firearms every single day. You know, bad guys get shot every single day. Why do you know about this case? Why is it being shoved in your face, shoved down your throat? I'm not going to provide you with that answer. You, as an intelligent person, need to question that. Don't just accept, oh, I have to know about this because CNN told me I have to know about it. Why? Why? What are we doing? What is the, whose dog is in the fight? What is the purpose behind shoving this story in your face 24 seven nonstop? And why was it several months after this happened that they decide to file charges against Zimmerman? You know, it happened. They investigated it. They did not file charges until who? Jackson, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton got involved. So they're attorneys now. So when Jesse Jackson throws a little hissy fit, we all have to jump and say, how high is that it? Is that where we live in America today? When Al Sharpton whines about something, we all have to stop what we're doing and listen to him. Is that it? Uh, Ask yourself that, you know, if you're living, I live in Mississippi and I'm having to hear about something that happened in Florida a year ago. People get shot every day. Police shoot bad people every single day in America. Do you know about every police shooting, every justifiable homicide that goes on in America every day? Is it on your you know, TV screen? Probably not, uh, especially if it happened in New York and you live in you know, Texas or it happened in Georgia and you live in Oregon. You don't care. It doesn't affect you. And ask yourself this, even if you are watching it and you're concerned and you, you know, you're interested in it, ask yourself this. If you live in Oregon, does it really change or affect your day to day life? What happened in Sanford, Florida? Probably not. But this one, and my feeling about this trial has always been this, that it is being put forth by the left by people that don't want you to have guns, by people that don't want you to take it into your own hands to defend yourself. How dare you, citizen, peasant? How dare you, peasants, take it into your own hands to defend your own lives? That's the government's responsibility. And if and when the government decides they want to save you, they will. And if they decide that they don't, they won't. Was it uh, episode... I don't know. It was a previous episode we talked about the uh, the woman out in was it Oregon, Jared? It was Oregon, wasn't it? Called nine one one. Said my crazy ex boyfriend's here, and they said sorry, nobody's available. That you know, and when we talked about the fact that the government is not responsible for protecting you as an individual, well, if they're not legally responsible to protect you as an individual, who is? Well, it's you, right? Let's talk about some student of the gun lessons learned from the Trayvon Martin felonious assault trial. Now, number one, and this is a big number one, and this is why it's a good lead from our last question. Always, always, always have some type of a bridge between empty hands and a gun. If you're going to carry concealed, if you're going to carry a firearm, if you're going to have a firearm available, As a use of force against deadly force, against a deadly attack, you need to have something else. You need to have an alternate use of force. Well, why is that? Well, we talked about it a little bit before, and we talk about it in great detail on the Armed Living DVD. Well, not every assault, not every problem that you will encounter out in the world is an an immediate deadly force situation. You know, somebody, the drunk who, you know, the annoying drunk who won't leave you alone. The guy at the baseball game who says that your kid is a punk and blah, 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 and he wants to fight you. Whatever. You can't whip out your Roscoe and shoot all those people. Because if you do, you're going to be the bad guy. But at the same time, if you're carrying a gun and you end up in a fist fight, what is that? 
Well, number one, the last thing you want to do when you're carrying a firearm on your body is end up in a physical altercation. You don't want to be fist fighting people. You don't want to be wrestling people because why? What happens to guns while you're in the middle of wrestling on the parking lot with somebody? A lot of times they fall out onto the parking lot. And when your gun is loose scraping across the parking lot, is that a good or a bad situation for you? It's a bad situation. The last thing you want to do if you're a gun carrier is to go hands-on grappling, punching, kicking people. Now, if you have to do that, do it. I'm not telling you not to do it, but don't put yourself in a situation deliberately where your only options are to use your empty hand or a firearm because you'll do either do one of two things. And this is the natural tendency, especially for people that don't have to arrest bad guys on a daily basis, and I'm assuming most of you don't, is to either underreact to say, well, I don't know if I should get my gun out. I don't know if it's gone far enough. And you hesitate and you hesitate and you wait and you allow the situation to escalate until now it's no longer tenable. Or the other side is I'm scared. I don't have anything but a gun, so I pull the gun out. So now the annoying drunk, I have him at gunpoint, I get arrested for felonious assault or something like that. You don't want to put yourself in that position. So what is a good gap? Well, probably the most readily available and affordable gap between empty hands and a firearm for you, Johnny Citizen or you know, Susie Citizen, is OC pepper spray. Think about it. Pepper spray is, number one, it doesn't require you to touch the bad guy. It doesn't require you to grapple with the bad guy. It re- all it requires is four to six feet of open air space. You say, stop, get back. They don't get back. You spray them. If you know anything about the, uh, the Martin felonious assault trial, what happened? How did it happen? Well, when the, uh, the fatal shots were fired, the victim was on his back having his head smashed into the ground by the attacker. Now, they're like, the attacker didn't have a gun. He didn't have a gun. If you're on the ground, let's say you're 40 years old, an 18-year-old, 17-year-old who is taller than you and stronger than you, let's face it, young people have youth and strength on their sides, not so much experience or intelligence. But you're on the ground and your head is being pounded into the concrete. How long are you going to last before you go unconscious? Not very long, ladies and gentlemen. If I said, if I asked you, hey, I'm going to pound your head into the uh, into the asphalt, how many times am I allowed to do it? Well, how many would you let me, how many times would you let me pound your head into the asphalt before you said no more? Uh, zero? Yeah, probably zero. Uh, and what happens when your head gets pounded into the concrete? We talked about deadly force. You know, what is the definition of deadly force? It's death or serious bodily harm. Serious bodily harm is what? Any type of physical harm or mental harm that require prolonged hospitalization, prolonged rehabilitation, or potentially damage you for life. And having your head beaten into the concrete hmm, could potentially damage you for life. So, but before he ended up on the ground on his back with this guy on top of him, banging his head into the ground, if this person, if George Zimmerman, if he would have had OC spray, the guy approaches him, hey, what are you doing? Why are you taking my picture? Whatever, whatever. And he said, get back, stop. He doesn't get back and stop. You give him a juice, you give him a second one, you know, give him one to grow on of pepper spray. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, I wasn't there. I know you know I wasn't there, but if he would have used, if George Zimmerman would have been a student of the gun, like he should have been, but hey, he wasn't. If he was a student of the gun, he would have listened to us, bought our, uh, gotten the Iron Living DVD, taken the advice, and had a gap between empty hands and a firearm, such as pepper spray. You probably never, ever would have heard his name. If he'd have given him a good snifter full of Fox OC, he would have said, hey, this ain't so fun anymore. I'm done. I'm going to get out of here. Then the, he would have been able to say to the police on the while he was on the phone, hey, I sprayed him with pepper spray. He ran and he's hiding in a bush behind a house. And then we would they would have sorted it out. And like I said, you would have never, ever heard the name Trayvon Martin or George Zimmerman because that would have been the end of it. But because he was in a position where all he had was his empty hands and a gun, 
what happened. Well, he, he was in a bad position. Now, am I telling you don't defend yourself with a gun if your head's being beaten off the concrete? No, of course I'm not telling you that. But what I'm telling you is with a little bit of forethought and training, you can hopefully prevent yourself from being in that situation. And the number two lesson learned is understand justifiable use of force before you have to use it. You can't, I mean, making it up on the spot is not a good place to be. You need to understand what is justifiable. When is it justifiable? And how do you do that? Well, you do that by education and training. You know, and now the good thing about, you know, non-gun or non-shooting endeavors or non-physical endeavors is you can read, you can watch DVDs, DVDs, you can listen and so forth. But yeah, you need to, if you are planning or you think you may have to defend your own life someday, maybe with a gun, you need to think about it beforehand. Yeah, making it up on the spot is not a good place to be. And also, like we said about the hesitation or the overreaction, uh, number one, you don't want to hesitate and put yourself in a deadly or precarious position, but you also don't want to overreact and then put yourself in a, a, a criminal position or find yourself in a position where you're going to be held civilly liable. So, uh, you know, take the time, get some training, get some, pra- you know, not really practice, but get training, get education. And, and I've said it before, we, you know, as, as student of the gun, we're probably the largest free training university as far as firearms in the United States right now, because we provide all this material. All you have to do is listen to it. All you have to do is go watch the show. Uh, you know, yes, we do make some money on the books and the DVDs, but we provide a tremendous amount of this information free of charge. And you're welcome. Now, number three, after the fight is over, You've won your fight. The fight has ended. You're probably going to be huffing and puffing. You probably will be injured. Let's face it. Violent encounters, deadly force encounters are fast moving. They're extremely hyper violent and they take place at close ranges. Generally, the person is going to be able to touch you. They may have knocked you to the ground. You may have fallen to the ground. You may have. And even if you didn't make physical contact with them, trying to avoid the situation, did you twist your knee? Did you wrench your shoulder? What have you? You've got a lot of adrenaline dumping through your body. If you're in a deadly force situation, you have a tremendous amount of adrenaline that is dumping through your veins at that moment in time. And what do we know about adrenaline? Adrenaline is a tremendous uh, pain inhibitor. It, it you, When the adrenaline is dumping through your veins, you could have a wrenched shoulder, a twisted knee, a broken ankle, and not even realize it until the adrenaline fades away. Uh, they say it's 60 times more powerful than morphine um, until it fades away, and then the adrenaline fades away, and you're like, ah, my arm, my leg, my shoulder, my whatever. Here is the deal, ladies and gentlemen, especially men. Listen up, men. Stop trying to be a hero. Stop trying to be the tough guy. If you just survived a deadly force encounter, you're sitting on the curb. There's a guy bleed, who is bleeding to death or has bled to death you know, out in front of you. He was trying to make you dead five seconds ago. Now he's not. You're probably injured. You are probably injured. You may not know it. The adrenaline may be masking the pain, but you need to get your, you know, and if, if he pushed you, shoved you, if you fell, you might not even remember it. Dudes and dudettes, let me tell you what, the time-space distortion dur- that you encounter during a heavy adrenaline dump, you may not remember at that moment in time that you were hit in the head. You're like, how can you not remember, Paul? Do I, If you don't believe me, research it. But what I'm telling you is this, you may be injured and not know it. When the police arrive, when the emergency services arrive, tell them, I want to go to the hospital. I need, I've been injured. I need to go to the hospital. Because, well, number one, any, no law enforcement agent in, you know, in the United States of America is ever going to tell you when you, they come to the scene of a shooting and you're on the ground there and you say, I need, I need medical attention. I want to go to the hospital. They're not going to say, no, you're going to sit right there until I find out what happened. <laughs> if, if 
by some crazy stretch of the imagination, let's just say we're in bizarro world and you just have had a deadly force encounter with a, with a felon who wanted to make you dead, harm you, rob you, rape you, whatever. And they're on the ground. You're sitting there. Police roll up and you say, I think I've been hurt. I'm injured. I want to go to the hospital. And they say to you, no, you're not going anywhere until I figure out what happens. Guess what? You just won the lottery because you're going to own the police department. You're going to own the city that you're living in. If a police officer denies you medical attention when you've re- when you've requested it, he's going to be collecting garbage. No, he won't even be collecting garbage because they make a lot of money. He'll be picking up cans on the side of the road. That's not how it works. Because when a police officer arrives on scene, here's what he has to figure out. Who's going to the hospital? Who's going to the morgue? Who's going to jail? He's got to figure that out and sort it out quick, fast, in a hurry. And is there anybody else still running around that needs to be shot? Once that's all that has to be figured out on the scene, he doesn't need to know where you bought your gun, what you had for breakfast, what your favorite color is, you know, were your parents married or divorced. He doesn't need to know any of that stuff. We can figure all of that out later. So there's absolutely no reason why you can't go to the hospital. You're alive. Deal with the living people. Take them to the hospital. What do we know about the Zimmerman case? Well, they took cell phone pictures or camera pictures at the station of him and so forth, right? If he would have gone, if he would have said to the police officers, I want to go to the hospital, I need to go to the the emergency room. Rather than all this, he said, she said, you know, cell phone pictures, pictures at the station later on after they've wiped all the blood off his head and stuff. What they would have had is they would have had an ER doctor's detailed description and report exactly down to the letter of every injury on his body. Think about that. Would you rather have an emergency room doctor's report on your injuries or just the opinion of the cop that arrested you and took your picture at the station? I think I'd rather have the uh, the detailed report of an ER physician. And you know what? If you go there and the ER physician looks you over, you know, x-rays your head and stuff and says, no, you're you're OK, you know, then great. Go team. You're good to go. But if you get there and you find out that you're having a heart attack, uh, that you've got internal injuries and you're slowly bleeding to death, that's kind of an important thing to know about, right? So if anytime you're in a violent encounter, as soon as the, you know, your life is saved and you're no longer in mortal jeopardy, when the emergency services show up or even you'll get on your phone and say, I need to go to the hospital. Let the professionals tell you that you're okay or you're whether or you're not. Stop being the tough guy. I know this is the hardest thing in the world for men to do because they want to be the tough guy. They want to, oh, no, I'm all right, man. I'm good. No, bull crap. Bull crap. Get yourself to the hospital. You're alive. You want to stay that way. And all the other stuff, they can work out later. They're, you know, that's it. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about is you need to be prepared for the eventuality that you may be charged. Now, when it shakes out, when it all shakes out, you may be completely acquitted or exonerated of any wrongdoing. Hey, good. Go team. And if you've done things right, if you practiced, if you studied, if you trained uh, and if you're educated, then chances are that will be the situation. But mentally prepare yourself and also prepare yourself, uh, I guess, from a... uh, a, a, a logistical standpoint or that you're going to need, you should have the number of your attorney in your phone. We talked about that before. Have it in your phone, pre-program it and put it not just under his name because under the stress, under the adrenaline dump, you might go blank and not even remember your attorney's name. And it's under Saul Schwartz or, or whatever, you know, uh, put, save it as the name attorney. You know, you can remember the word attorney, right? <laughs> and and also, you when you talk to your attorney, you might want to ask him, look, do you have 24-hour-a-day, uh, you know, voicemail, or not voicemail, but a uh, an answering service, so if I call, I don't just get a machine that says, hey, I'll get back to you sometime tomorrow. Because if you need an attorney, you need to talk to him pretty quick. Uh, insurance. There are different types of insurance that you can get from various organizations. You can get it from the NRA. 
Uh, there's an organization called U.S. Concealed Carry and so forth. But you might want to think about that. Look at your homeowner's policy. Most homeowner's policies, believe it or not, if someone breaks into your home and you know tries to rob you, rape your wife, what have you, and you use deadly force against them, you will fall back on your homeowner's insurance policy. Okay, so be prepared for the fact, mentally prepare yourself for the fact that you may be charged, you may be sued. Because like, it was put to me this way in the police academy. Anyone in America today, anyone can sue anyone else for any reason at any time. Just because you're sued doesn't mean you're going to lose. Just because you're charged doesn't mean you're going to go to jail. Charges and convictions are not the same thing. You know, being sued and being found guilty are not the same thing. Anybody can sue anyone for anything. And if your greatest fear in life is being sued, if you're more afraid of being sued than you are being murdered, then you're really just a victim waiting to happen. So lessons learned from the Trayvon Martin felonious assault trial. Before we go, hey, we want to congratulate, we want to congratulate our week number four crossbreed holster winner, and that's Ben Lee of our home state of Mississippi. Congratulations, Ben Lee. And uh, make sure that you guys are checking out KeltechWeapons.com. Check them out on the Internet. And, of course, CrossbreedHolsters.com. And don't forget about our good friends at the Firearms Radio Network. Hey, we just uh, we were just told that uh, we found out that there's going to be a new show on the Firearms Radio Network. So you can go to Firearms Radio Network and check out all the gun-related shows there. Now, remember, you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. 